Good morning, everybody. So my name is Brock Dahlman and I work with the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center and wanted to talk today about this concept of rewilding. And one of our perspectives on it is really talking about rewilding uh, keystone processes. And so we're gonna get right into it. But as you can see from this image, we're really talking about earth and air and fire and water and life overall and how we rewild those processes. I want to start off by welcoming everybody to Planet Water. It's really the only place in the known universe where life is endemic, this concept of life and honoring this planet that we live on where this expression of this amazing miracle called life exists. And I've been a life lover for a long time. I'm a professionally a biologist, a wildlife biologist, and I've been chasing tadpoles since I was three years old in Japanese rice paddies while my dad was on his third tour in Vietnam. And just to put some of this into context in a bigger picture and honoring the work of James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis and their collective Gaia hypothesis and this understanding of looking at the planet as an emergent whole where the presence of life, the whole of life is really greater than the sum of the life forms itself. And that uh, this planet has created conditions conducive for life on itself is the uh, feedback mechanisms that are unique to this planet as far as we know it. And critically, when we're basically looking at these processes, there's a sense that energy flows. And this energy we really see as a verb, as dynamic, as process, and the reality we should all be sun worshipers. And then matter cycles, and this basic laws of thermodynamics about matter neither being created nor destroyed, but it does move around. That gets you to the periodic chart of elements and, and elements and atoms and the molecules they make and the matter that cycles, and that really does matter actually. And then the beauty of it is that life webs. And so with flowing energy and cycling matter, life plays with those verbs and those nouns to create webs that are reinforcing and resilient over time. And one of the great cycles is really the photosynthetic cycle. And the fact that now you can imagine six CO2 molecules combining with six water molecules with sunlight energy into chlorophyll, whether that's in a bacterial cell, an algal cell, or a plant cell, and that sugar is created and oxygen is given off. That is one of the great miracles, and it's been happening for almost three billion years on this planet. And it's both in the oceans and it's both happening at, on the land and terrestrial ecosystems. And so we're really into this sunlight, into sugar, into the seas and soil salvation cycle. And we should all partner with this as, as people on this planet. Uh, Jacques Cousteau, to paraphrase a statement of his, is really basically that the water cycle and the life cycle are one cycle. So car life as we know it on this planet is carbon-based life. Central atom of life is carbon. But by volume, we're mostly water. And, and that's really important. And one of my great heroes, I will admit as a junior Darwin overachiever is Darwin and I think he's super cool. And this idea that it's not the strongest of the species that survives nor the most intelligent, but it's the one most responsive to change. And that's really what we're up against a lot right now on this planet is a lot of change and change is the only constant. And that's a process-based reality check. Um, <clears throat> a lot of us, in our various design worlds talk a lot about forms following functions and really understanding form as product and noun and those are really derivatives of process verbs that happen through space and time so for instance this map that's a beautiful rendering artistic rendering of the watersheds the drainage areas say within the lower 48 states and that the beautiful pink in the center of the Mississippi drainage, or in fact, a little bit to the left, that chartreuse of the Colorado River drainage, which I can attest recently is an unbelievable, uh, one of the great Gaian temples and testaments to deep time on this planet. And forms can follow dysfunctions. And it's really a process of disturbance, which disturbance is an expression of change and interaction. And the question for many of our humans, at least our settler colonialist Western dominated paradigms of seeing the planet as a commodity versus a community is the result of a series of degenerative disturbance, destructive disturbance, degradative disturbances, 
versus being regenerative disturbers. And I think is a fundamental didactic question we as a society have to face right now. Are you a degenerative disturber or a regenerative disturber? And really that gets us into understanding keystone processes and flows such as something what is known as the anadromous nutrient pump for those of us who live in the Pacific Northwest, what is known as salmon nation, lamprey nation, where you have these organisms like salmon and lamprey that are born in freshwater, they go to salt water, they get really big because there's a lot of food there, they return to the freshwater to spawn and die, and that food, that nutrient, those molecules that they gained from the ocean are brought back to the land, and then through their death, and then being eaten by other animals and decomposers and birds and bears and eagles and vultures, those nutrients are spread out to the land and return to the land and increase the fecundity and resiliency of the land. So that's a process-based approach to understanding resiliency. And a number of us have been working for a long time on returning what are known as keystone species or totem species. For instance, in our area, coho salmon is a keystone species. And there's been a, num a lot of work happening in Western Sonoma County in the greater California area around coho salmon recovery. And this is a, some images of an effort that happened collaboratively with a number of agencies and private landowners and community groups in the Salmon Creek watershed of Western Sonoma County to bring coho back. But we really think about watersheds from the ridgeline to the river down to the reef and understand that the condition of the watershed is a direct indictment of the historic and current upland land uses and the abuses. And so when our streams, for instance, in Sonoma County are dirty in winter with lots of sediment, like the upper image in the left, and then they're completely dry in the summer, that's a direct indictment of the last 150 years of Western human settlement in our watersheds. It's been an extractive based process of uh, removing the natural capital because of a perception that the land is a commodity. And really, I appreciate this concept by Gregory Bateson, a really wonderful thinker and author, that the major problems in the world are the result of the difference between how nature works and the way people think. And the possibility of thinking like a watershed, really understanding from the headwaters to the, to the delta, is important and ecological illiteracy, I think is one of the greatest epidemics we've been facing on this planet for a long time. It's much more uh, intense than COVID will ever be in fact. And the opportunity is really to get to the work in the headwaters. And I, and I appreciate the, this book by Freeman House called Totem Salmon. And this quote from that book that the first thing we learned from salmon was the importance of the watershed as a unit of perception. But the unit of perception that's got to get it is this one. And, and the game is how do you mitigate cerebral imperviousness so that we can infiltrate into the headwaters this need for ecosystem restoration? What's the storyline we believe? Is the planet a community or a commodity? Are we a part of it or apart from it? That's a process-based pedagogy and honoring the traditional indigenous wisdom of many native peoples and specifically Oren Lyons, the faith keeper of the Onondaga people here. This quote of his and theirs that what you people call your natural resources, our people call our relatives. And while Einstein had a theory of relativity, indigenous wisdom has a theory of relativity. And when they say all my relations, they actually mean it. And so in being in relation with say salmon for salmon based people is a, is a reverential relationship and a reciprocal relationship that's based in humility and honoring versus extraction and uh, um, <clears throat> of what we are witnessing now and why salmon are on the brink of extinction pretty much everywhere where modern human settlement is happening. So sometimes you gotta step up to the mic and speak truth to power in that regard and embody your inner Salmonid and, I can just say that if you're speaking to the Board of Supervisors in a foam salmon suit in the summer, you might wanna wear shorts so that you're not sweating too much in that suit. Thankfully, a number of people and colleagues have really gotten on the recognition of moving from our fixation, our material fetish on things and nouns and really understanding verbs and flow. And some of the great work of uh, a number of our colleagues out of the, uh, Utah State University, Joe Wheaton and many of his colleagues in 
uh, river restoration work have really gotten into articulating this language. And, and we at the OAC Water Institute and our Bring Back the Beaver campaign and Kate Lundquist and myself have been working with these folks a lot and appreciating the collaboration of this process of thinking about processes and really uh, recognizing that streams need space, watersheds need space. It's really about reclaiming space from the enclosure of the commons, if you will, the fragmentation and the anthropocentric land uses that have often um, taken up all the space for, for processes to occur and the wildlife that need that space and the corridors and the connectivity and the flow. And really honoring, and again, some of these slides from Joe Wheaton and, and Utah State University of how they're looking at stream restoration and moving away from streams that have just a single threaded channel to these more diverse streams, to complexity, to things that might look like a mess, but to a beaver, they're perfect and they're complex and they're slowing the flow and they're retaining nutrients and they're holding on to the energy in the process that's moving through them in a good way. And, and that's something that uh, I think we could all use to learn from in many aspects of our society as we think about rewilding species, rewilding connections in our landscapes for increased resiliency. And so a lot of these processes are, are based in structural processes, compositional processes, and thus functional processes. And we could think about that, especially in California recently with our number of years with fire. Fire is a keystone process. And you can either, the question about fire in many respects is the frequency of the fire and the intensity of the fire. And when we had an indigenously managed landscape using fire as a healing tool for the last 10,000 plus years in our area in Sonoma County, fire was used very frequently with a low intensity. And what we've shifted in the last 100 plus years is to a low frequency fire that has high intensity. And so how do we, for instance, reclaim a relationship with pyrological processes where there's a frequency and an intensity balance and we use fire as a regenerative and healing tool for a series of processes. And that's some of the work we have done at the Oxford Arts and Ecology Center over the years. And here's an article that I wrote for the Fremontia Journal about what we call Mending the Wild, which is a take on the book by M. Cat Anderson called Tending the Wild and really honors, honoring a participatory relationship and those of us, our capacity to become agents of regenerative disturbance in relationship with other species and the processes that they depend upon. And so at some point we really step it up and think bigger about what I call this basins of relations. And it's really from summit to sea and ridgeline to reef, how as rewilders can we become regenerative disturbers of all these critical keystone processes to create these conditions that are conducive to convivial coexistence with a probiotic cycle instead of the antibiotics that we're so fixated on, which is really the idea of being against life. We're actually for life, we're probiotic. And you know, you, you can find another spokesperson if you need. And in this case, uh, one of our favorites from the vernal pools of the Santa Rosa Plain is Sal E. Mander. And so just when you thought you had enough on your plate to think about rewilding keystone verbs, you can also engage with the fact that climate change is synergistically exacerbating and amplifying the cumulative impacts of fragmented and deranged watershed conditions, functions, and processes at all temporal and spatial scales wisdom from Sally Mander. And so I don't want to lie to you, but the puma is telling you that you got to be relying on the big critters and bring back the carnivores. And with that, I thank you for your attention. All right, team, there you have it. <clears throat>